Good evening and welcome back to this lovely chamber. council chamber. We can talk to each other and see each other properly. Um, I've just I've been asked to read out a little statement um, about concerns about COVID, but Oh, is that better? Yeah. Is this working? Or is it just mine? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Although most of the uh, government's COVID restrictions were lifted yesterday, can I remember remind members that many people are still concerned, especially during this time of rising infections. So out of respect for our colleagues, can I remember remind members to still wear masks when entering and exiting the building, to wash and sanitize hands regularly, and not to congregate whilst inside the building. So you can chat in the car park. I'll uh, now move on to the webcasting introduction. This meeting is to be webcast that's being done remotely, but it, it is being done. Members are reminded of the need to activate the microphones before speaking and be close to the microphone. <laughs> um, sorry, and will be capable of a repeated viewing or another use by such third parties. Therefore, by entering the council chamber, and using the seating area, you are consenting to be filmed and to the possible use of these images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training. Before we go on to item two, I'd like to introduce Tim Matthews, a newly appointed councillor who is now vice chairman of the committee and will keep me in order perhaps. And I'm Peter Bolton, uh, chairman of this committee. Item two, apologies for absence. Yes, Chairman, apologies from councillors Bassett, Brady, Brooks and Joggia. Thank you, and substitute members? Yes, Chairman, we have councillor Heather for Brady, for councillor Brady and councillor Lyon for councillor Bassett. Thank you. Um, if we can then go on to the minutes of the previous meeting, um, which are on pages 5 to 14. Um, are there any points of correction from members and visitors? Can they be accepted as to be signed off? Yes, thank you. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, please? Thank you. Move on to number six, terms of reference and work program, which is before you. Are there any comments? Um, it's, the terms of reference are actually mentioned twice in the agenda and there are slight differences between the two. Um, but if we can go through the formal ones on pages 15 to 18. Any one point I'd like to make is that on page 17, on the three, digital, in Asia, a, digital enablement, that will include the IT strategy. It is just not a technology strategy, but it will include the IT strategy, which has up until now been quite an important part of our, of our work program and agenda. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of items that I've spotted I think need to be added to the work programme for future meetings. 
So I think there should be a, a, a quarterly financial report, uh, a, a monitoring report on the, on the agenda as well. And uh, also I think the Qualis uh, quarterly management uh, report also should come to this committee in future as well. So I think they'll be need, to do, need to be added to the, to the work programme for future meetings. Qualis has been a point of major debate in this committee before and it should continue to do so. If we look at number eight, local elections, that slightly disappeared from our agenda, but there, I believe, have been some concerns about the recent local elections, and there will be a presentation at our September meeting to review how things went with the last um, elections and how they are to progress, um, hopefully, in May next year. Sorry, any other comments to this part of the agenda? No? We will now move on to the corporate performance, performance reporting, which Mary then... <laughs> sorry, the press will uh, present please and if we can go through that thank you yes yeah, so um for those who haven't met me so mary von hassel um, i'm the service director for the strategy performance and delivery section so i'm going to take you through the report um, both the project portfolio report and then the kpi piece afterwards um, my plan wasn't to walk through item by item um, to do it on an exception basis rather than go through the whole thing because otherwise that's going to be quite long. Hopefully that works for everybody. Um, so what you'll see, just some highlights before we go through. So um, obviously this is part of a kind of uh, regular cycle that we have. So we've been through a process of understanding all of the service plans, putting all of the service plans together, creating a list, a portfolio of, of, of projects and things. And so what you'll see on this list for, for the first time probably is some new things that went on from last year. Um, this is obviously the first quarter for this year. Um, the other thing you'll notice is there aren't any red things on there at the moment. Um, that's partly because there will have been a, um, a baseline, a re-baseline for any projects that carry on beyond the end of last year. Um, there was quite a lot, I think, red on the last, on the quarter four from the end of the report. Um, there's also quite a lot on here which is blue, as in complete, which is good because that's how things should be. Um, and some of the things we're not sure at the moment whether they will continue to be reported on here. That's part of the reason that we've included them. So if there are things on here that you think shouldn't be on here, whatever, or things you think should be on here, then we can um, go through those. Um, so if that kind of makes sense as a process, what it, this also covers is for the um, three sets of portfolio meetings that we have, so the stronger uh, place, communities and council, this pulls all of that together into a single report and covers the KPIs for the whole piece. Okay, so if I walk through, um, in terms of the first section, um, so obviously there's a, a, a we have, as I said, we have no reds. The first amber on there is a community culture trust project. Um, and as you can see from the comment on there, the, the plan there is to actually understand, to, to kind of take a step back and actually understand um, what needs to be best done to deliver on this. Um, we've implemented a, a new governance process so this is now actually taking a much more formal approach to actually looking at the projects that we're doing checking that we're doing the right things and then stepping through that process so this is one of those that's gone back to concept stage as part of that um, the next one to highlight is the uh, uh, while you're on that page can i raise a, a different one please i wanted to ask about the museum collection rationalization um, I'm concerned about that. I read the recent portfolio holder decision and very nearly called it in because this has been taking place without any um, information coming to members. You sort of heard about this, um, uh, sort of uh, checking on all the stuff in the, in the museum. Uh, a report did come to um, some strong communities about the museum and I did ask for uh, you know, further information to come but it never actually came. Um, it says here that all Northfield items not being kept have left the collection. What's, um, 
involvement was with people like the Parish Council or the um, North Weald Museum and the other sort of historical organisations from North Weald to know whether there were items there that they wanted. Because this is sort of the, the district's history in many cases. These things are governed by um, local people. Um, it reflects local history, which members probably know about, and officers who come and go don't. So I don't know who this um, steering collection is, a co committee is, that um, it goes to. It's, it, you know, it just hasn't been brought to members, and I think it's something it should. So could you just answer the questions about um, you know, things being um, disposed of before local organisations are consulted? Maybe they were, I don't know. Okay, um, so I, I don't have the answer to all of those questions. Um, in terms of um, the inf information here, it actually is saying it has gone to committee, so I perhaps need to check that if you think that you've not had visibility of that. Um, so I can take that away and ask the question and come back with some clarification. Okay. Yes, per perhaps any response? Anything could be added to the minutes, um, particularly the involvement in the in the, in the parish council, because I, I agree um, with Councillor with Whitehouse that that airfield and the museum is very very important to the people of North Weald in its present size, and I think will still be important when it doubles in size, uh, po possibly. Um, sorry, yeah. Okay. That's fine. So, I mean, that's great. So that's why we're bringing the reports to have the conversation. So that's good. Um, okay, so moving through um, the next one, I was going to highlight the next, um, I think, amber on the list was about the, the reprovision of the hostel. Um, so, so the update on this is it, it's not moved from last time and uh, a proposal has been put in place for plan for September uh, this year. So that will, that will come back for a discussion. Um, moving. So which hostel are we talking about? Are we talking about Norway House here or Hemel House or somewhere else? I don't know the answer to that. Actually, I don't know whether does anybody else know the answer to that. Sorry, I missed that. Your question again. Which hospital were we talk are we talking about here? I don't know. Um, but we will. Sorry. I haven't got a, a correct answer or a definitive answer for you, um, Councillor Whitehouse. I think it's one of those ones we'll have to take back again. I had in my mind it was provision of a new hostel, but I... But I I don't want to give you a, an answer here and now because I don't think it'll necessarily be a correct answer. So we'll take that one away and come back to you with a, with a written response. Yeah, I, I just I would just like to emphasise the point that if we're going to say reprovision of hospital, and I'm glad you're going to come back with an answer on that, but we we don't want such generic titles because it doesn't tell us anything. It really doesn't tell us anything, and how can we scrutinise anything if we don't actually know what we're talking about? Point taken and agreed. Um, it should have said which hostel. Yes, thank you. I was just going to show you, I mean, if these were derived from service plans, I mean, they must have gone through cabinet members and portfolio holders in the cabinet. So, I mean, how come no one seems to know what these, what these topics are about? Just to say that we're currently going through service plans again at this moment in time to update them for the, for the forthcoming year. Um, so I assume that most of these are, are projects that have been in existence for a while and, and, and probably not all of us are aware with the history of some of these items one way or another. 
uh, in terms of the current process, so, so the service plans are at the moment going through Cabinet to, to make sure that Cabinet are content with them. And then they will come back through, um, probably through the, through the stronger uh, committees um, to uh, uh, get blessing or, or, the, or to share the projects with, with the membership of those committees to make sure that we are focused on the right activities. So in terms of refresh of service plans, that's happening at the moment. Uh, but, but I assume that these programs, so these projects are, have been in existence for a while and need a refresh in that case. Well, that's fair enough, but the longer they've been in existence, the more likely you would have thought is what, what was it people knew about them. Councillor Lyon. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I've raised business plans or, or what were business plans, which I think now service plans, uh, with Mr. Dorr uh, um, from the Place Select Committee. Uh, uh, I've gone back and tracked from the corporate plan to look at how each portfolio is actually delivering. So I'm asking for those service plans to be presented to my select committee. Um, and I think there's something we can discuss at the chairman's meeting on the 22nd. But I think it's imperative we actually look at what the uh, service plans are um, and, and align those to each of the select committees. It, it is imperative that we get those. And I think it's you know, partly because of Councillor Lyon's uh, interest in, the, in that subject is, is why Cabinet are currently going through their service plans. The service planning process was being done by officers anyway, but uh, recognising the councillor's interest and, and the need for stronger committees to be involved in, the, in that process as well. So we're currently working through those to be able to present them to the stronger committees in due course. Yeah, there, there is a timing issue here because obviously uh, as a select committee we need to start our programme. I know the place select committee, perhaps it's not right to discuss here, place select committee hasn't actually got a work program um, and we're really dependent on getting those uh, service plans through so we can actually look at what is being planned for the council um, in the year to come and actually design our work program around the service plans. Uh, after all if we are scrutinising the decisions of cabinet we need to get into the cycle early enough on to be able to make a difference. Um, as things stand and I, I've done a review of uh, past members from the place select committee um, a number of comments were many of the reports were verbal not written reports and they were too late in the cycle to actually influence what was going on so it, it's something that I think we do need to address as, as chairman of all the select committees and maybe bring it back through overview and scrutiny. Thank you chairman. Yes, it's, a, it's the start of a new year and that's the timing of some of these meetings has been a little unfortunate because this meeting has taken place um, several days before the joint chairman and vice chairman um, committee where we, we coordinate the work of all the three committees and it's unfortunate that they're around the wrong way and we were, would stress that that... that is not an ideal situation and hopefully can be remedied for future meetings. So, um, it, so yes, I think the, the debate's really good and that is why we've presented the information to make sure that it is right and reporting the right things. Um, so I think rather than go through each of them individually, as you can see, the next set at Rambas are all things that are um, up for discussion at the moment. So in some cases, things that we thought we were going to do and now we're questioning whether we should still be doing those now, the timing around those, um, or whether we should be doing them at all. So th they'll be going through um, kind of governance cycles to, to check that. Um, and then some of them are newer things like um, in, in the next set, the telephony solution, looking at what we could do to improve our, the customer experience in terms of telephony. Um, in terms of the next set, there's nothing on those ones. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I've got some other updates. That's the customer portal. Um, I've got one that is currently shown as green. Actually, the latest update on that is that it's closed. So the um, local skills and opportunities, um, we've had an update since the report was done. 
which is that that has actually reached its uh, final milestone. So that's handed over. That's the development portal. That's handed over to business as usual. And that project is going to now be closed. So that will be moving to a blue, which is for future reference. Uh, in the next set, oh, sorry. Thanks, so I'm just looking at page 24, um, the digitization of the customer journey and the um, improve the member's experience of the customer. I mean, what was the outcome of that? Was member's experience improved? Uh, and what evidence do we have to tell us whether it was or not? So I was just trying to find the same one that you're looking at. The digital members journey. Okay. Okay. Great. Yep. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so there's a series of activities that are happening in this space. So, um, so this is the work that's largely been driven from the customer services area. So this is around. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to put that. Yep. So this is around. Um, uh, a focused activity to make sure that members are getting a better journey through the um, engagement experience. So, so it's things like making sure that, um, as we were just doing earlier, people can log on appropriately, that they can engage when they have issues, um, and that those things are managed through the process. In terms of measuring those, um, for me, that would be around things like understanding how many people are having issues. So where we were and where we are now and, and where we want to get to. Um, I, I think there's still a way to go on that. Um, I think we're still discovering some of the issues as part of that. Um, a lot of that is through the engagement process, though. So the more that we engage and understand, the more we can make those things better. Councillor Lyon, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, on the uh, customer, or members' experience as a customer, I can say, as a customer, um, I'm far from happy with the, the performance of the service that, that we're getting at the moment. I have had a conversation with Mary Yvonne this afternoon and she did explain that the processes they're going through to improve things, um, but there's a long way to go. Um, one example was the fact that uh, after reloading my iPad uh, through a long-standing fault, my mod.gov wasn't working. Um, I reported that last Wednesday and until I chased it this morning, it was still not working. And that's something that should take a matter of hours to fix. So what I will be looking for, uh, looking at some of the KPIs, but it's going to come later, is a mean time to repair um, and, and repeat faults, that sort of stuff, which we really need to see how performance is improving and how performance is recorded. And I'm sure that is something that is on the cards. But from the reports I've seen on this particular meeting, it's not very effective at the moment. Maybe it's just a timing issue. Having looked at this, I, I think it would be unfortunate if this disappeared from the agenda because there are certainly members who are finding um, this method of, of work quite difficult and I don't think the problem has gone away and it, it shouldn't disappear from, from, the, from scrutiny. Um, I don't know if other people have had concerns as well, otherwise we'll move on. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so just to um, add to that, um, so I think what was being proposed here wasn't that we don't do any more work on it. I think it was just saying it wasn't a project per se. It was, it was a business as usual as, a, as in a continuous improvement, but we can, we can still report through here if that's more helpful. I think we absolutely realise there's more work to do. Um, okay, so just scrolling. Sorry, Chairman, maybe uh, because I've not been involved, but is there a closure report on that project? Um, so what were the results of the project? And, and has there been a report brought to this committee to say the project's closed and the success criteria uh, that have been measured against it? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So, so I think that's a great question, absolutely right question. So um, I, I haven't seen the final report on that. I think we should, we should get that and get it, get it to you to see. 
Yeah, sensible. Councillor Janet Whitehead. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask about, on page 24, the councillor portal. <coughs> Um, it says about progress, none. It must be two years since we had a presentation on the council portal. We were asked to give our ideas on, on what we want to see on it. And I can appreciate that, you know, it just hasn't progressed very far. But what's frustrating is the things that we used to have, like the yearbook. When I ask where is the yearbook, I'm told, oh, it's not necessary. We, we've decided not to do it because the council portal will give you that information. Um, personally, I think the yearbook should continue. We have... I personally have absolutely no way of contacting any of the new councillors because one of the important things in the yearbook was the addresses, the phone numbers, the emails of all the councillors. And some of them were private, not to be on the public uh, view on the website. That information is no longer available to us. And I think until the portal is up and running, some of the information, maybe not all of it, we don't need the uh, timetables and, and some of that stuff. But I actually use the yearbook quite a lot. I did have it on the computer. It didn't have to be paper. But I would like to see that information put out as soon as possible, particularly the names and addresses of councillors so we can contact them all. But, you know, what is the progress? I mean, two years, and it says none. It's rather unbelievable. Yes, please. Is that right? Um, so um, what that's actually saying is Although it says no progress, none, it's because no work has happened on it. So it's not as if lots of work's happened and no progress has been made. Um, it's about priorities. So what we're trying to do is put on the table all of, all of the things that we're currently working on and sharing the, the set of priorities that we have. Um, if they're the wrong set of priorities, then we need to understand what are the things that we should be working on. So that's, that's why it's, it's not moved. Um, it's in that state. Um, in terms of the yearbook, I'm not aware of that, so I don't know what decisions have been made around that. Um, I can go away and ask the questions about that and, and what, what, what was its purpose and what gap did it fill um, to understand. I, I think that was... I don't, I don't know what point that was removed. I can ask. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the yearbook, I know the yearbook is is currently visible as an option in mod.gov, but I haven't checked its contents recently. Whether it's been updated at all, I have no idea. So I think that would be a sensible suggestion to uh, maintain that uh, yearbook link uh, from the website within the restricted area of, uh, of the website. Um, so I will certainly make sure that happens. Um, with regard to the discussion about the digital member's journey, um, it's important to stress that that was a specific project because we were in a very bad place as far as uh, member IT was concerned and we wanted to push forward and get uh, a larger percentage of members online and using the corporate addresses. The point about this being closed as it were, it's not a closed, it's, it will always be an ongoing issue. IT support never stops uh, and what is key and important is to members or indeed any other customer is the turnaround time. How long does it take to fix a problem? That's, that's the key thing. Um, and it's not a question of, uh, I'm sure there is a report to be produced about to say we've gone from 40% uh, take up to 85% or whatever it happens to be. I don't know the numbers. Uh, and we can happily uh, produce that report at the, the next meeting. But the key point is the turnaround time for members or any other customer in terms of IT fixes. The Councillor Portal mission, it's a pet project of mine, um, and uh, I, I put up a fight every time we discuss this with officers in as much as I want to see it happen, probably more than anybody else does, um, but there are priorities. We have, as you're all well aware, we had a, uh, a large reshuffle, let's term it that way, in terms of our IT support staff. Uh, we've also had this, uh, to uh, completely refit. Uh, that's all come down through the IT team. They have been fantastically busy. We've got the shift across to Microsoft Office 365. We've got the migration to the cloud. These are all big projects that take a lot of time. And I've had to concede throughout the preceding months and years that my little pet project has got to go to the back of the queue. Um, we've only got finite resources and there are more important things to do. Um, if it was me setting the targets and setting the priorities, this would be at the top of the list. But, as I say, there are 
more important things to be done for the council and for all our residents. So I think that covers most of the bits that have just been discussed, if anybody wants to come back on that. Councillor Helen Kane, please. Yeah, thank you very much for that. But um, as members of this committee, it would be nice to actually have some kind of information and uh, history so we do not actually ask questions where is the report and what the results are. Uh, it is vital because we are not m cabinet members and we do not know what's going on. So really it is important to have reports of how that journey really went and what kind of, uh, and we appreciate that the IT department has actually done wonders, but it is important for us to justify as well within the report that they have made wonders. Thank you. Thank you, any comments? No, no I think that's fine. I think, um, I mean, just to come back on the uh, reporting, we do have an, a new system in place that does metrics for things like the, the ticketing system that we have. So I did show Council Anne earlier. So we're in a much better place in terms of being able to pull those statistics together. So we will be able to generate those going forward to, to help us to understand everything. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I think it's vitally important that, that these projects, if they are closed, that there is a closure report written and we understand what has been done. Um, previously, there was um, a, a project uh, control mechanism in place where new projects were established and they were reported to the, the committees and then as they progressed, there were reports regularly proposed uh, and a closure report and lessons learned. Uh, we seem to have lost that function. Um, and uh, I think it's essential if there is going to be any vital scrutiny that that actually means anything that, that this committee should see those reports. Thank you. If I may, Chairman, I'd just like to say point taken, acknowledged and action will be taken you will get those reports. Thank you. Councillor Kay. Thank you. Okay, is it okay to me? So, um, so I, I suppose rather than go through, I say, rather than go through all of the others, or any others on there, um, are there any others? So the only one I saw is going to highlight the um, travel local. So um, that update on that, so that's going to be, um, uh, moving that will be part of the sustainable transport project going forward. So um, cabinet's approved a one-year extension for that service. So that's going to be funded up until April 2022, um, and it's due to report into cabinet in September on progress impact of, of the program. So that's currently flagging as green. So that was just a confirmation because it wasn't in the report. Um, are there any other bits that? Yeah. Councillor Stephen Neville, thank you. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, uh, I know you're just going through the, um, uh, the bits where there's a bit of a question mark. I'd just like to go back to 20, page 26 um, and the engagement and well-being. I think it's uh, very important uh, that we've be tackling this, but uh, it says mental health first aid is training in September 2021. Would that be open to members as well? Because I think it's vital we get a grap grapple on mental health issues as members as well as staff. Hello. Um, I think we need to look at that. Um, and if you would allow me to take that away um, and look at that, I will come back to you. Okay, so, so in terms of the um, overall project status then, um, I think that goes all the way through to the end. There are no other additional updates on that. Um, the next section of the report then looks at the KPIs in terms of reporting against the agreed indicators. Um, as I flagged earlier, 
the, and I think has been discussed, there are, uh, in terms of the process and the cycle, um, having the meeting today, 20th of July, is actually a very tight time scale to get the stats from the end of last quarter um, out of the systems that they need to come and be processed and then in, into the report. So the report that you were issued had a, a set of those missing. Um, I have managed to get some of those. Some of those are quite, um, that have just been produced today as an example. So I can go through those if that would be helpful. Um, I believe what has happened historically is that then they've been included in the next quarter's report. So you'll be able to see those. Um, and I think one of the things we might need to look at, and I think has been alluded to, is we might just need to think about the timings of the meetings to kind of help with that. Um, because obviously what we're trying to do is to give you as complete a set of data as possible in one place. Sorry, Councillor Neville, Stephen Neville. Yes, I think that would be very, very helpful because I was uh, somewhat disappointed, shall I say, seeing a whole set of KPIs without any figures to them. It just seemed pointless almost doing them. But I'm glad to say that you see that you've got some of those figures now to, but it would be nice if we can synchronize everything up, uh, all our different time scales, and, and therefore have a full report with all the right information so we can scrutinize it rather than what we've got today. I think it would be difficult to go through them all without having them down on the page. But are there anything that you would like to highlight? And we will expect a full report by the next meeting. Either happy to do that, or if there are any that people that are not in the report that people have questions on, I'm, I, I, I might have those here. So I've got the ones for the customer services area, the people team, and the planning and development teams. So if but if there are no questions, then that's fine. Councillor Lyon. Okay. Chairman, j just a, a point. Um, reading through some of the other actions, local plan delivery. Uh, as, as one, that there seems to be quite a lot of overlap between the three different select panels. Um, and I think that needs, we need to work out which it, select panel is doing what, because local plan delivery is also in the place select panel. So I think there's got to be some clarification as to who's doing what and how these things are going to be scrutinised. We don't want to repeat scrutiny uh, between different committees. Uh, for the same thing, so we, that I think is important. Um, the other point I wanted to mention was about air mitigation, uh, air pollution, and I think that not only relates to the forest, but it relates to humans. And I think one of the things that does need to be looked at is air quality around schools. So uh, maybe that's something that you could consider. Thank you. When we set up the select committees um, we agreed we would review this um, after a year and I think the year is up and um, that will be an important discussion we will, when we have our joint meeting of chairman because as Councillor Lyon has said there is a lot of overlap um, and therefore sometimes um, subjects get diluted or not debated or over debated and lost in the system so we're very aware of the comments that have been made and we will hopefully address this uh, when we meet in a few days time thank you sorry and can, it, can I just add that's, that's absolutely fine so <laughs> That's fine. So, so obviously we have the, the three committees and supporting that we have the three steering groups as well that run. Um, they meet on a monthly basis. Um, what this is trying to do is to collate from across all of those committees into a single place the set of the, over, the oversight of all of the projects and all of the KPIs into a single document. Councillor Sam Kane. Thank you, Chairman. I was just wondering, yes, uh, uh, Mary Vaughan just pointed out this is an amalgamated report covering all, all projects and therefore covering all scrutiny committees, but it might be useful, Mary Vaughan, if we added an extra column indicating which scrutiny committee each item was going to. Is that acceptable and possible and it can be done? 
it, it's in the report. It's just we shouldn't we took that column out to make it clearer for you. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I have that data. Yes. Back to you. Or have you finished? No. So I, I think that that was it in terms of the, what I was going to go through. But I say happy to take any more questions. Just a comment, Chairman. The the, uh, the report highlights on the on page 19 uh, a summary of all the things that have been considered. I'm just wondering whether some of those things should be part of your work program. Um, Address to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, what are you asking? Sorry, I, I, I heard the words, but what? There's a list of, of actions and activities and projects in, in that page 19, um, and some of those could be turned into items within the work programme so that they're scrutinised on a regular basis. So I don't know whether you know that would be appropriate to actually align that with the work programme and look at them on a more regular basis. So for, in, for instance, um, Climate Action Plan, green, green Infrastructure, by the way, that's also in uh, the Blaze Select Committee. Um, Customer service, research and feasibility recommendations. I mean, how do they get transferred, translated into projects? So it, it was just something, uh, you know, that some of these items could be actually included in the part of the work programme. <coughs> Janet Whitehouse, Councillor Janet Whitehouse, and then I'll get back to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at the last, I think it was overview and scrutiny when we were being asked for um, items that we wanted to go forward for scrutiny. I did mention the Green Action Plan because that was something that came regularly to the Neighbourhoods um, Scrutiny Committee when we had that, and that's dropped off completely. So I imagine the, uh, the Green Infrastructure Strategy and Climate, um, climate uh, Action Plan uh, are sort of de de derived from that. So yes, I would agree I, those should come. I'm not quite sure which committee it would be or whether it's to you know, overview and scrutiny itself, but I have asked for the Green Action Plan already to come to one of the scrutiny committees. And I think this is something we, we could easily debate in our um, joint meeting of chairman and vice chairman um, and address the issue that Councillor Lyon highlighted of making sure that this becomes practical and streamlined. Now go on to item agenda eight. I'm afraid you've not got off the hook, Mary Yvonne, um, because you're presenting this item, please. So, um, yes, yeah, so presenting the paper on accommodation. Um, so this is an update um, from any previous things that you've had. Um, obviously, the timing on this, this report was issued so that it could be issued into this uh, committee meeting was before uh, yesterday, which was the ending of lockdown and the building opening to the public. So things have changed a little bit since the report was written, um, um, which I can go through as well. So um, as, you, as you can see from this, so the, the building has, has been opened, um, all of the issues and things have been worked through. Um, in some cases, we're still working out how we want to do some of the things that we want to do, and we'll learn some things as, as we start using the building more. Um, so I expect things to change as we, as we go through this. So we will be formally closing the accommodation project um, in the next few weeks. What we will do as part of that is we will look at um, if there are any actions, any activities left, um, what happens to those to make sure that they're covered, and also we'll look at what's next in terms of understanding how we start to use the, the new space that we've developed. So hopefully people have seen it. It's very different from what was here before. 
Um, so the intent in terms of how, how um, employees actually uh, come in, use that, engage with that, engage with their colleagues, engage with the public, um, will be very different. So we're going to learn lots through that doing and, and then we'll change those things if, if we need to. Um, so in terms of the familiarisation sessions, they've happened over the last few weeks um, and more recently and are happening now going forward with teams. Um, obviously, we opened the doors yesterday. Um, what that didn't mean is that everybody suddenly rushed into the building. Um, it's been done on a team-by-team -team basis um, in terms of uh, making sure that we understand how people want to work in their teams, having those conversations, doing familiarisation with those people. Um, we have been set up since yesterday morning, uh, ready to accept the public. We have had the public coming in, not very many, um, which has been very interesting. I think um, in light of the, the current uh, guidance and things, I think people are still quite cautious. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how that changes as, as we go through um, and, and we'll continue to adapt. Um, some of the other pieces we're looking, so things like the community hub, um, we're looking at the best timing for opening that. It's all ready kind of technically, um, but it's about understanding that people are going to be comfortable to start engaging with that. So we'll talk to the partners about those types of things um, and, and, then, and then work through that. Um, so I think that covers off most of the things. Um, some of the things, obviously, it refers also in here to the uh, tenancy on the second floor. So um, there is a, the, a work is underway to discuss that as well. So, and also um, work is underway discussing with um, Essex County Council about uh, usage of some of the ground floor space for the library. Um, those things haven't been finalised. Um, probably the last thing to finish off, so we have done a lot of work around trying to get rid of some of the physical equipment that we had, particularly around things like printing. So we had some very, very large printers. Um, the last of those is due to move, I'm going to say Thursday. Um, uh, so that will actually uh, free us up to be able to use the space for other things as well. Happy to take any questions on the accommodation project. Councillor uh, Janet Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't agree this, is, this project is ready for closure at all. I think it needs to stay open and we need another report to come to, to the committee. Um, members have not, most of them, not had the opportunity to see the building yet. That's not going to happen until the 29th of July. And when that has happened, there needs to be some mechanism for members to feed back their comments on how the building works for our needs. There's been a singular lack of consultation with members. Um, I'm sure it's happened with perhaps the Cabinet and, and, and some of the more sort of senior members. But as far as most of us are concerned, we had a consultation just before the building closed and we were shown some of the furniture and things like the shared um, space in what was the members room was uh, we were told about that but we've heard nothing in between and I think one of the examples of that is I read in the our ways of working the fact that the air conditioning will go off in the evening the evening is when members come in to use the building we need the air conditioning on but I think that's a prime example of lack of consultation and lack of understanding of members needs in using the building so I would ask that um, once the members have done their tour that you have, you know, you advertise in the bulletin how we are to put back our comments so that you can become aware of the needs that we have in using this building as well. Because, um, you know, our needs are different to those of officers. And I just feel that our needs, we've not, we've not been asked really what our needs are. I just have another question to ask. I've noticed on the Our Ways of Working and some of the officers too, they mentioned this, they call this building the Civic seems a really funny term to me. I mean, civic is an ad adjective. You can have a civic offices, civic buildings, civic responsibility, but the civic is like saying the happy, the rainy. You know, it just doesn't make sense. If you want to have a new sort of look to the place and feel, it could be the civic centre, but it can't just be the civic. I mean, it's meaningless. So I don't know where the decision was taken because it's not consistent. Some officers are referring their reports to civic offices. Some are saying the civic. But, you know, it would be interesting where, to know where this... Um, term has come from and surely there should be some agreement from us as to whether we we like it personally i don't councillor helen kane okay i'm actually going on from what councillor janet wire has said on page 45, item 3, the familiarisation of briefings for members, 
That hasn't taken place then. Item 3 on page 45. And the, uh, the summary. We're due to have briefings and tours of the buildings. That has never taken place. If so, I've missed it. There is a tour organised for the hour before the council meeting. Oh, right. Yes. I understand. I, I miss. I'm. I miss that one. But yeah. Right. Councillor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, originally, and that is so many months ago we were actually asked what we would like to, to see. And there were different people that we talked and we said about, you know, like the, the, the seats need to be a little bit higher, we need to be comfortable, things like that. But since then, uh, a lot of, of uh, people have actually left and other people have taken over. And all these notes that we actually, uh, that we were asked and we, we said, they disappeared. And that is why I'm, I'm very concerned that th things are changing without us uh, being informed of the changes and why there were those changes. And I think it is very, very proper to actually have a, 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 not a report as such, but just an analysis what has changed from the original plans that we were sitting and looking and we had the consultations. Thank you, Chair. I'm just listening to members' comments, actually, uh, and, and recognising that, that, that most members won't complete the familiarisation training until until next week. It does seem sensible that we should uh, wait till, till that is undertaken and, and then do some sort of exercise to try and capture members' views. Uh, so we'll do that uh, after next week's familiarisation session has, has taken place. And then we will come back with a further report to this committee about uh, the views that we've received from, from members uh, to, to have a debate at that point in time. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor John White. Thanks, Chairman, and th thanks, thanks for the report. What's the logic behind no longer dis distributing recycling sacks from the civic offices? I mean, there was a message that went out last week saying the improved civic offices are opening, you'll no longer be able to get your rubbish sacks from it. And I fail to see how that's an improvement. Um, I mean, it's one of the basic services, you know, waste collection and recycling that the, that the council provides. If we're looking for increased footfall through the civic offices for people to come to events and uh, community hub and so forth, um, why withdraw this service, which is, um, yeah, I mean, what, what, how is that an improvement? It, it seems to me a, a retrograde step. And what, what's the logic behind that decision, please? Is an officer I've got to take that? Yes, thank you. So it's my understanding that the, the number of centres or, or locations where you could collect the recycling sacks, one that was recycling sacks from has increased so uh, we didn't need the civic offices as a location uh, and, and there's plenty of provision around the rest of the district as it is I mean I would have thought the more provision the better as long as people are only taking one at a time but uh, um, I, mean, it's, 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 I mean it's a convenient location isn't it there's there's house to home uh, down this end of, of, of town in Epping but uh, um, it just seems to me you know, a basic service, and it seems odd that you can get it everywhere apart from the organisation that pro provides the service. Point taken. Um, thank you. Councillor Morgan. Yes, what I'm going on from what has um, been said, I mean, originally um, we were going to have a member's room would be the same, I uh, understand for members to congregate in and do any, if they want to do any work. I understand we haven't got a member's room any longer. So, yes. 
I mean, it's probably a, a good idea to see the space, but if part of a familiarisation session bef before you know, we have a conversation about that, the space is still there, uh, but it's now a shared space for, for officers and members to use. Uh, it's badged as collaboration space, but it still looks very familiar, I think, for most members that have used that space previously, and it's still available for members to use, as is, in fact, all of the space in the building as well. So rather than concentrating members into one particular room, there's a whole raft of new rooms that members can now use as well. Yes, this was discussed during the planning. I'm sure that when we all meet and have our tour, we will then communicate with each other quite vigorously as to what we feel is happening and, uh, and uh, hopefully act constructively towards the development of this change in this in this in the civic center we'll move on to the supplementary agenda <coughs> which was uh, doing a survey beyond the pandemic and it also includes a video presentation. And I don't know whether the idea is that we would start with the video presentation, please, and then move on to the uh, report, if that's yeah, acceptable. Kevin, if I just give you a, a quick summary. So um, let me just introduce myself first. My name is Joanne Budden, and I look after the people team at Epping Forest. Um, so I'll just give you a quick brief summary of the report that was written and submitted um, today. So in April 2021, we designed a new employee survey called Beyond the Pandemic. Um, this was a follow-on from our employee wellbeing survey that happened in 2020 during um, the pandemic and lockdown. Um, we wanted to encourage employees to give us continuous feedback around the way that they wanted to work going forward coming out of the pandemic. Um, we asked employees to answer the survey. We gave them 42 short multiple choice questions um, and the survey took no more than 10 minutes to complete. Um, and that survey was open from April to May um, this year. Part two of the survey, we thought it was important to include um, some travel questions around how people were going to travel in to the Civic going forward. Um, and we wanted to continue to um, encourage the journey of change at EFDC to make EFDC a opportunity and a great place to work. So we have got a video presentation of the summary results to give you today, the employee survey results. And if I can just ask Jackie, um, if she can play that video for me, that would be great. Thank you, Jackie.
Um, thank you for watching the presentation video. I appreciate there's a lot of information in there. So I'm going to provide you a very top level summary of some of those statistics that are included in that presentation. So we had a total of 292 employees take part in the survey, um, which is a great response rate actually. So it's an 82.02% completion rate. Um, some key highlights um, of that exec summary that we've just shown you is 73% of those that responded um, that are working from home feel that it's a really positive experience. Um, in the future, respondents would like to work from home or remotely 66.1% of their time, um, and that's on an average. So for a full-time employee, this equates to three days a week um, at home, remotely, and two days in the office. The benefits of working in a more effective, flexible way from home or remotely are no commute at 80%, the flexibility that that offers at 78%, increased productivity at 57%, reduced costs at 56%, and time with family at 48%. 34% um, of their respondents said that they felt that they had, they had an improved well-being and health um, from working from home. 93% of respondents agree, and they're really clear um, around what is expected of them to deliver whilst working from home or remotely. Working with effective flexibility, um, what do people anticipate may be the main reasons for travelling back into the civic? 63% um, said about collaborative working. This engagement and messaging that we've been trying to embed over the last 18 months has really landed with our employees. To question what do they think the biggest challenges are of continuing to work from home or more remotely, 47% of respondents said that they struggled to create clear boundaries between work and home um, and felt that it had mixed into the two. 40% 40, 40 said loneliness. Um, they felt quite isolated and lonely um, by working from home. And 34% said longer hours versus their typical working hours. They felt that it was very hard for them to switch off. The survey then moved into particular questions around travel. Um, car travel seems to be the most popular um, with a high number of employees. Um, and the council is offering employees a chance to receive a free annual membership for the uh, DART 87 transport service at the moment. So some actions from the survey, immediate actions that we've taken from the insight that our employees have given us. That video has been shared and uploaded with our teams. Um, line managers have been asked to discuss the results with their teams. Um, 12 out of 18 employees that left verbatim comments, um, we know are working still from their dining room table, so we're looking at solutions that may meet the needs of those employees to make their work life a little bit better um, at home. Line managers are now very much accountable for leading that change with their employees, so really discussing what that future looks like for teams because we do realise that it isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. And the survey insight will further support and influence the people strategy and travel plans going forward. So I'd just like to open the forum up for any specific questions that you might have for me. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it, it is actually good to, to know how people feel uh, working for the civic offices and the travel arrangements. But what I'm really very surprised is we have out of hours services. And uh, this has not been uh, actually included in your survey. But how people feel about the out of uh, hours services, how do they cope with that? Do they answer the phone? Because I know, for a start, that it is three weeks that uh, we have no out-of-service uh, staff to answer any calls. So, you know, there are quite a few uh, points 
that they are very, very important because they are services that we are very proud of. Thank you. Any response to that before we then go on to Councillor Sanger? No, I take that feedback. Thank you. And um, we'll look at that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's good to be back at the uh, civic, civic offices. Um, thank you, Joe, for a, a great presentation there. Um, can I just start off by saying the last 18 months for everybody has been very difficult and challenging, um, and needless to say about our staff as well. Um, I just want to thank them, uh, really, for providing the frontline services uh, to us all in the district. Um, and uh, really want to touch upon, it's not a question, but more to say that I'm also very proud, um, I think Joe didn't mention this, but the mental health first aiders, um, we've now trained, I believe, if I'm wrong, you might be an update, 80, did Joe, is it more than 80 at the moment? Yep, so we've got 80 and we've got a new cohort in September, so we have, uh, we're, we're about one in six for our workforce at the moment, which is a, an, an amazing result for mental health first aid. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so 80 plus um, um, mental health first aiders. They, they actually provide a, a, very important, they, a very important role within the workforce. They support our officers um, for mental. Um, there's all sorts of issues that they support uh, our staff through. Um, I think uh, Councillor Neville mentioned the mental health first aiders for members. Certainly something that I think we may need to look at. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Small, you may want to comment on that. We can look at members being enrolled onto the mental health first aiders scheme. We need to look into that anyway, certainly. Um, but yeah, can I just say the new way of working as well, adapting to the new way of working. Um, there's success stories there quite clearly that um, people are comfortable working with the hybrid system of working home and from, from here as well. Um, but just really just to say um, thank you to everybody that's been working very hard through these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lyon. Thanks, Chairman. Um, very interesting presentation. I thought the stats just flashed before my eyes, but I mean, a couple of things which was important. One, I think you've picked up on, which was people working on the edge of their dining room table. And I'm just wondering how many of those people would, would not be happy working at home. I couldn't quite pick that up. Um, the other thought I had was about remote working. Um, I think you've looked at working from home or working in civic offices, but we have got other hubs. Um, we've got um, in Loughton, is it Oak, Oakwood Hill? Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether there's any other remote sites that, that you're considering using, um, which would obviously alleviate the problem. And I know having worked at home, for three or four years, it can be very isolating if you haven't got an opportunity to actually get together with other people, e even if it's for a cup of coffee across a photocopier or something like that. So, uh, yeah, how, how are you addressing those other sites where that might a assist people who won't have to actually travel to the civic offices but actually can work remotely? Um, when we uh, designed the survey, we actually designed that question um, around remote working and different sites, so we didn't um, we didn't promote it as a singular site. We we are everything we're talking about is multi-site and working from different locations. So library locations, Oakwood Hill, Homefield House, all of those different locations. So it's definitely in conversation. Yeah. Can I sorry. So, so were that, was that uh, an encouraging sign? Were people keen to do that? I think, it's a, I think it's a big change. So I think, yes, and as we work through it and we come out and people start getting used to working in different locations, I think we'll see more of that, absolutely. Um, I, I think we just need to be honest to say, you know, we've only just come out of this, so the 19th of July. So we need to give it a bit of time to embed um, but I think we'll see more people working from different locations, but it's definitely encouraged. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you for this report and uh, <clears throat> all the hard work that's gone into it. 
Um, one is firstly um, on the presentation, it, as has been highlighted, it did speed by uh, and it would have been better if it was a bit slower just so we could take it all in because it's there for us to be, to see and to look at and to digest. If it's whizzing past and we, we're only halfway down the page and then we're on to the next one, you know, it's, it's not very helpful. Um, but I like the presentation with the music, That's, that was nice and thank you for that. Um, in terms of the employees that um, did the survey, or, or I'm presuming the top line figure of 438 was the number of people it actually went out to, or was uh, that just that viewed the survey? So were there people who it was sent to that didn't even view the survey? That's the first question. So 438 employees viewed the survey. Um, we can't give absolute clarity on how many it went to, but we know that 438 actually viewed it. We know that 356 employees started the survey and 292 actually completed it. I, I surpri I'm surprised because if you, if you send out a survey, surely you know how many you've sent it out to. Anyway, um, in terms of going down the page to the uh, council is offering employers the chance to use the, receive a free annual membership of the DART 87 arm uh, transport service. Now I'm going to be, I'm very, very interested in that. How many have taken up that uh, offer so far? I haven't got the, uh, I haven't got the answer to how many have taken it up. I'm going to now follow that up with a provocative question. How many would it theoretically help? Because it only covers a certain corridor within the, um, the area. Um, and it's, uh, you have to do, ring up and demand it. It sounds generous, but is it very helpful? I need to come back to you on the stats of that because that, that's sitting with the, um, the travel plan um, and the travel plan doesn't sit with me, but I will come back to you with some stats on the, on the DART um, figures. It's obviously helpful to encourage people to use public transport, but it, it may be very limited, but we'll, we'll be interested to hear from you. Yes. My vice chairman now wishes to speak. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, when the survey was conducted, was data also collected with regards to the employee's age range? I think it would be quite interesting to see the correlation between those that were um, positive to working at home in relation to their age range as well, because I know particular uh, friends of mine that have been in this situation that are still potentially living with parents. If parents are working at home and they're also then working at home, it's becoming quite a difficult situation. And then they've also seen that perhaps the older generation and people that aren't necessarily going to work to embrace the social aspect as well were a lot more forthcoming to that. So if, if that information was there as well, it'd be really useful to know. Thank you. It's included on the employee data on the on the front page of the survey, so we've got the age range on there. Um, I'll need to look at whether that correlates within, um, but we definitely did capture age range as part of the survey, yes. Councillor Helen Kane. Sorry. Thank you. In that case, is there any chance that we could actually have that presentation sent to us because it might be a better option for us? And can you tell me, okay, that, that was very good, thank you. What happens now? What, will, what, uh, what would have happened further to that survey? What, uh, has, uh, uh, what will help you to do what? Can you please tell me? But please answer. 
So yes, I will send you a PDF of the presentation and the video presentation, so you'll receive both. Um, so that will help with the speed, obviously, because it will be a PowerPoint. Um, your second question on what next? So um, all of this data, so wh what I've presented to you is a very top level summary. Uh, what I have is a very detailed um, verbatim summary of um, feedback and that is what feeds back into all of our plans. So whether that is isolation and how people feel isolated and that then encourages our wellbeing plans going forward. Um, but there's an awful lot of data um, that we do go through um, and it does inform our people strategy going forward and our focus going forward on what we need to do next. Sorry. Is it, uh, do you have a time, the schedule, about what is going to happen next? And if so, is there any chance that we can actually have a, a report or, uh, you know, to, to say, you know what, we've done all, all this and now we are progressing to that and that's the next stage and the, the next stage as well. Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is provide you updates, really. So as we move forward and we evolve the people strategy, um, I'd like to come and provide you updates of what we've done, what we're doing next, um, and how that's helping our employee wellbeing going forward. Um, if that's something you'd like me to do, then I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a really good video. It's a really refreshing way to actually digest data. Um, uh, my question, I've just got a couple of questions in relation to the integrity of the data, and I appreciate that it's easy for me to ask these questions, and it's not always so easy when you are trying to get um, employees to... I, I appreciate how difficult it can be for employees to complete these um, surveys. Um, I just want to know what safeguards or what checks were done to ensure that there was a cross-section of the council staff completing the survey, i.e. what safeguards were they in place to ensure it wasn't too skewed to a certain department or a certain type of job, um, and, and ensuring that there was a good cross-section of the council staff completing it. I guess my second question um, is what safeguards were there to avoid duplication of surveys, so i.e. how could you prevent, for example, an over-enthusiastic staff member filling in the survey 100 times, for example, and my third question, very briefly, is 80.02% completed uh, the survey. It probably would be quite useful to know um, how that percentage correlates to the overall number of staff members. So, i.e., what number of how, what's the total number of staff members uh, at the council, and what percentage actually then then completed the survey? I might need, just need to clarify some of those questions. Um, so our um, permanent and fixed term headcount is 508. Um, and that's the population of individuals that that would have gone out to. Now, they might, uh, that might have fluctuated slightly, um, dependent on headcount at the time the survey went out. Um, the survey, we were very conscious um, that we wanted this survey to be anonymous because of the data that we were asking people to provide. So we actually engaged with an external company. Um, so everything that you saw, as in the questions that came back, were completely market compliant um, and researched. Um, and, and we made sure that we were asking the right questions. Um, and there was a level of engagement within the council as well to make sure that, you know, we tied in things like the travel plan as part of that um, as well, so that we could gauge some of that thinking. Um, so there was a lot of collaboration on the questions that actually we provided to that external party um, and they fed back um, to make sure that they were market compliant and researched correctly as well. So is it right that only one employee could complete the survey once? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joan. Just a quick question. You mentioned a lot of data you've got. Have you got the data of staff that have left over the last two years for various reasons? We've lost a lot of good staff. And have you, are you up to full quota of staff for the 
uh, offices now. If you want me to share some of those stats, I've actually got them with me. Sorry? Tonight, I can share some of those KPI stats if you want me to. Yes, I've got sir. them with me. Um, so, let me just quickly check. So, our turnover, our staff retention is currently sitting at 3.3%. We lost 103 um, members of staff in 2018-2019. We lost 109 in 2019, 2020, um, and currently for this year so far, we've lost um, 117, but 79 of those are including cheapy transfers. So actually, we've we've we're quite on par over the last couple of years, and actually we've decreased this year so far around staff retention. So what is the total over the last few years? Um, so, yeah, so 103, 109, so, yeah, 211, 212, sorry. And the total amount is, is it about four, four, 64, 70 total staff? Uh, 508. 508, okay. <coughs> and that you replaced as well? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm not a mathematician, but I don't think those figures okay. add up. They don't add up, but you may want to look at them. The percentages you said was 3%? Overall percentage for this year so far is 3.3%, yes. I just asked members to look, look at, think about that. Uh, Councillor Janet Munt. Thank you, Chairman. I'm following up. Councillor Kane's question about what happens after the, the survey. I was going to ask you, this, the people who said they were lonely, uh, what you know, did you go back and say to them? But obviously you can't do that if it was anonymous. But I just wondered, did you put anything out in council bulletins or however you respond, you know, uh, communicate with the staff about things they could do, the ones who are feeling lonely? And the second question was, I noticed that one of the stats was a 68% females uh, answer the survey and 28% male. Just wondered how that reflected the balance of men and women in the council. So I, I can answer that for you. So our gender percentages at the moment are 37% male and 63% female. 37% uh, male and 63% female. And in answer to your first question, we are evolving our wellbeing support all of the time. Um, we run things like virtual coffees. Um, we um, do mental health first aid days um, with um, our employees. So we run a plethora of, of support um, for employees going forward. We also look and, and work very closely with the community wellbeing team um, to promote um, what they do for the community with our employees as well. So those exercise classes, um, so lots and lots of support for employees and we're building it all the time. Councillor Heather. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, with reference to paragraph 5.6, the employee wellbeing and their families wellbeing are first. Absolutely excellent. I totally agree with that. And then it goes on to say, including access to private GP appointments. How are we doing that? Are we, is that something we're aspiring to, to get? Or are we signing up to a private health scheme? Or are we using our position to get our employees to the front of the queue? So back at last year, um, in September, we launched a, um, a benefits platform called Perkbox, um, and that was part of our people strategy. Um, so as part of that benefits platform, we provide um, Perkbox Medical, which is access to an online GP 24-7, um, so our employees can actually get access <laughs> to online GP appointments. They don't have to wait um, to obviously see their own GPs. They can also get private prescriptions or NHS prescriptions as part of that service as well. When they do that, is that 
information fed back to their regular general practitioners or does it go under the radar? Obviously, there is a privacy um, perspective on that, and that's up to the employee to decide whether they want that online GP to feed back to their own GP. Uh, we don't have any involvement in that. That's entirely the employee's decision. But are they asked that specific question? Can we communicate with your GP? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Just some, some general comments, if I can, really, please. Uh, in, in many respects, the, the move to home working has been a, a grand experiment, really, at some level. Uh, not necessarily uh, in a way that we chose to do it, but at some level, it always so also always been planned in terms of the council's plans to consolidate its offices anyway. So, uh, but, but how it happened was pretty much taken out of our hands as a result of the pandemic, and it, it happened almost overnight. It's very difficult to keep track of your workforce, um, at least to stay in touch with your workforce as an organisation, I suppose, when everybody's working from home and, and in different locations. So it's really important to us that we understood how staff felt about working from home and hence the need for this survey. Uh, I know members have expressed it, uh, interest throughout the pandemic in terms of you know, how does the workforce feel about working from home. And so this was... this survey was done properly and, uh, and a fairly comprehensive survey too to try and actually make sure uh, to take a temperature check how the workforce felt about it. Um, I mean it also it happened to a, a great a large proportion of the country at the same time so everybody found themselves working from home and I think that changed some of the um, people's perspectives about working in, the, in that way. I'm really encouraged to see just how much of the workforce uh, our colleagues really have uh, enjoyed it. It hasn't always been the way. I think uh, there were some difficult days actually early on in terms of staff working from home. But now it seems to be generally embraced and in fact so much so that, that, that most staff don't want to go back into a wholly working in the office type environment anyway. And I think that's to say that is encouraging. There are still some challenges. Uh, so how do we make sure that staff still feel part of one organisation? How do we keep them engaged? How we keep, do we keep them informed? And that's an ongoing piece of work. One of the things that we can use the survey for, though, is to try and um, direct that work and to, to understand where the problems are and where we need to concentrate our efforts. So it is something we will continue to do, it's something that we'll continue to feed back to this committee on as well, really. And we hope that, you know, that you'll find that information useful and, and help in terms of shaping what the priorities should be. A couple of other questions that were asked, I think one was around the, the, the route for the demand responsive travel. I think it was my understanding that, that that route was selected based upon, that was pretty much the line where most staff uh, you know, were, were, could be, were closest to. So that was the reason that, that particular route was selected. I think it married with an old bus route as well. Um, I think Councillor Neville asked about members um, using the, the sort of the mental well health, mental health well-being training as well. Just a hesitation, in as much as obviously members aren't employees with the council, we just need to, to, to um, uh, sense check that. But um, uh, if, if we can in, uh, spread that out to members as well, I'm sure we'd like to. Um, I think that that's uh, all I'd like to say at that point. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Lyon and then Councillor Kane, please. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. Staff retention. Do you recall staff retention by length of service at all to see how long people are actually staying and continuing to stay? So if, if they leave within a certain period of time or stay longer, so just that one. And then do we have a defibrillator on site? Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one, do we have we got any information about broadband services at home and how people are actually finding access to the corporate network from working from home? So broadband service is part of the survey results, um, and it was a really high percentage that people felt that they had adequate broadband service to be able to cope working from home. Um, the second question, yes, I'm absolutely sure we do have one on site. Um, I don't know where it's located, but I'm absolutely sure we do have one on site. 
Um, and your first question was about um, stats, wasn't it? So, um, yes, we do break it down, and yes, we can break it down um, into service areas. As part of my job, which I'm about to give up, um, we have mandatory annual CPR training. Um, these defibrillators make a diagnosis. They're very clever. I think everybody should know where they are um, because uh, that's how you save lives, by defibrillating people. If they're dead, they're dead. If they're in fibrillation, you can get them back, but you need, do need to know where that defibrillator is. This is a complex building. Would that be a reasonable suggestion that everybody knows where it is? Not just to steal them because they're probably worth money. But because <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Just following on from uh, Andrew Small's comments there, uh, it occurred to me, had we conducted this survey in February 2020, just before COVID hit, how very different the results would have been. Um, at that time, we were contemplating uh, leaving the civic offices uh, and then returning to a uh, desk to staff ratio of seven to ten uh, people that the underlying murmuring was it will never work it's it's going to be a nightmare how on earth are we going to do this and then bang covid happened and we had to and because we had to the whole accommodation program was accelerated by five years and here we are with people saying how nice it is working this way around so with with that in view have you got an intention to repeat this survey exercise in six months' time to see how people are settling into the hybrid way of working as opposed to the exclusively at-home working? When COVID appears to be over. <laughs> you know, six months might be too soon. There's still... Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. When it's no longer <laughs> affecting our way of life. Is that a reasonable compromise? Sorry. Um, so again, as part of the Hurt Box platform, we have an employee engagement flat, uh, platform as part of that. So we survey all the time, frequently anyway. Um, but as in bespoke surveys um, around the pandemic and ways of working, um, we do plan on, on running another one in six months, yes. Okay. Councillor Sanger. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. I didn't really want to come back, but thank you for allowing me to. Um, we had the opportunity of um, having a tour around the civic offices, um, and I think when you get an opportunity, please do take the opportunity to have a look around. Some of the stuff that's been um, provided for our staff is amazing, and some of the areas as well. I know Jo probably undersold her presentation, but there's the people's hub room, there's the wellbeing room, and there's a non-digital room as well. Um, all of that is to support the staff. Um, there's the perk box platform. Um, I urge you to have a look at what that is about. A lot of uh, responsible employers are looking to invest in that. Um, let's face it, the biggest investment for any employer is their staff investing in their staff. And that's how you keep down the retention numbers down because you keep staff happy. Happy staff is, uh, makes a happy employer. So um, but well done to everybody. Um, and Joe, well done for the presentation. Thank you. Councillor Tim Matthews. I'm really hoping my maths are right here, um, so I don't <laughs> make a fool of myself. But if the head counts 508 and completed is 292, that leaves us, so we had a completion of 57.48% from all the staff. So you've mentioned the follow-up surveys. Has there been any discussions or plans on how to target the, I mean, we're obviously just over, over half there. So have we got plans in place to try and target the remaining staff and, and get better engagement in the survey so that we really build a bigger picture of what all the staff members feel about this. Thank you. 
I guess when you're looking at a survey, you're looking at um, it being voluntary and not mandatory. Um, so I think when you go out with a, a mandatory element to try and entice everyone to complete a survey, then you get a lower engagement result anyway. Um, and that's what we've tried to avoid. So we've tried to make it that it's voluntary, you know, but I'm hoping that those figures will increase um, over time. Um, and we'll get more trust in employees to complete those surveys because they'll start to see the difference that we're making from their feedback. I think you all heard that. <laughs> I call this, oh, the times of uh, future meetings. Um, are, are down there um, subject to environmental factors etc otherwise I call this meeting to an end at uh, 8.42 thank you thank you